Number 10. The Orcada Space. Antarctica is known for many things, from being home to the largest population of penguins to the cold. But did you know that Antarctica is also home to one of the Earth's most remote locations when it comes to military bases? The first military base to ever exist on Antarctica is known as the Orcada Space. It was built by the early Scottish government way, way back in 1903. The Orcada Space was eventually transferred to the name of the Argentine government in 1904. Perhaps maintaining a post so far from home proved to be too taxing. Anyway, the Orcada Base is located on Lorry Island. It's currently the longest-running military base spanning across 11 buildings in Antarctica. It can house about 45 people in the Antarctic summer and 12 people in the cold and harsh winter. Of course, the military base is not for naught, since it's been the location of major research involving continental glaciology, meteorological observations, sea ice zone glaciology, and seismology. They're basically the ones that are going to warn us about climate change and other natural disasters that are on the way. You could say that their objective as a research facility for the good of humanity is all clear as ice. It is Antarctica, after all. Number 9. Comandante Ferraz Antarctic Station. Who would have thought that the tropical country of Brazil would decide to try and settle in Antarctica? It's true. The Brazilians successfully built a military base in Antarctica for research purposes. It was named the Comandante Ferraz Antarctic Station. Quite a fancy name for a military base, isn't it? Well, it's because it's named after a Brazilian Navy commander going by the same name, Luis Antonio de Carvalho Ferraz. He's the first Brazilian to ever set foot in Antarctica, and when he did, he started negotiations and lobbying for the Brazilian government to put up a base there. Unfortunately for Ferraz, he died before he saw it happen. But in 1904, the first Brazilian base in Antarctica was built and began operating. Unlike other military bases, Comandante Ferraz sports some cheerful colors of green and orange. It's currently located in Admiralty Bay on King George's Island and can house up to 60 people in the summer and only about 12 in the winter. It's built on top of one of the dangerous spots in Antarctica, which is constantly hit with harsh weather conditions and a strain of bad luck. Eventually, the station was completely destroyed in 2012 after a massive fire that leveled 70% of the entire facility. It took the Brazilian government eight years to rebuild the base, and only recently they got back to business in 2020. The base of Brazilian Antarctic Research now specializes in oceanographic research and still operates to this day. Number 8. Base General Bernardo O'Higgins Riquelme Chile was one of the first countries to set up a military base in the middle of the Antarctic continent, and that is the base General Bernardo O'Higgins Riquelme. The Chilean Republic set up the military base of operations in Antarctica during 1948 in a Chilean Antarctic expedition. Though in hindsight the base isn't any more special than any other base, outside of the fact that it's one of the longest running bases in Antarctica. That is, until 1991 when it became one of the only satellite bases in the Antarctic continent because of the German Antarctic Receiving Station. Also, the man it's named after is actually one of Chile's finest heroes, named for General Bernardo O'Higgins Riquelme, who led the campaign that freed the Chilean Republic from the hands of its Spanish invaders back in the 1800s. The base is also located in the Trinity Peninsula in Cape Legopil and has a well-built exterior and equally sturdy interior. It can hold up to 44 people in the summer and 16 in the winter. The base Riquelme excels in satellite monitoring and, fun fact, it's one of the only bases whose location has signal reception data probably even faster than your internet connection provider, which further proves the point of the satellite station being set up there. Number 7. Port Lockroy Station A Most military bases are pretty old, and it's almost impossible for all of them to remain active after years of occupation. While talking of them, we can't go on without mentioning at least one abandoned and possibly even haunted Antarctic military base. We're talking about Port Lockroy Station A, which was abandoned by the military but converted into a museum. Station A has no definitive name as a base since it was made a military base of operation by the British Army during World War II and set up on top of the once peaceful Port Lockroy. It was a British research facility for many advancements and technological research until 1962 when it ceased all operations. It was then turned into a museum in 1992 by the British associations to preserve history. It shifted quickly from being one of the oldest and most established military bases in Antarctica into a tourist attraction for Antarctic visitors. Though Station A is technically not completely abandoned and is in limited use today, its historical contribution to Operation Tabarin in World War II is undeniably significant. It's also the first research facility to ever conduct research on the Lonosphere, the amplifier for the radio waves we know today and the facility to hold recordings of the very first electronic waves, this military base has made several contributions to the world. Number 6. Gonzalez Videla Antarctic Base 
Penguins, one of Antarctica's most well-known and beloved residents, are a subject of much research, including their mating and breeding behaviors. That's where the Gonzales Videla Antarctic Base comes into the picture. The Gonzales Videla Antarctic Base was named after Chile's 24th president and is located in the Paradise Bay of Antarctica's mainland and was built in 1951. The Chilean research facility was initially planning to test out some aircraft flight over the South Pole led by two men, Thomas Bagshaw and M.C. Lester, as part of the British Imperial Expedition. However, they soon abandoned this project and instead moved on to research about how penguins bred. Yep, that's right. They sacrificed aircraft research to focus on the penguins, and it was definitely worth it. With that project in mind, Bagshaw had written the first scientific study about penguin reproduction. In fact, the descendants of the penguins that they had studied still live in the Gonzales Videla Antarctic base. Though the base now remains inactive, it stands as a historical site for such an entertaining story. As Napoleon once said, great achievements are usually born out of the greatest of sacrifices and are never the result of selfishness. And now, we know how penguins multiply. Number 5. Esperanza Bay you may have already guessed by now that Antarctica has a variety of military bases from different countries, and you're probably wondering why. This is because seven different countries claim parts of Antarctica, though no country legally owns the entirety of it, and that includes Argentina. The Argentine Esperanza Base, or Hope Base, is just one of many parts of Antarctica that Argentina has built a military base upon. Esperanza is a full-blown military base, and has also served as a civilian settlement for Argentine residents. It was built in 1953, but is built upon Chilean territory that was established way back in 1904. It's also one of the most established settlements in Antarctica, as it has a civil system where people can live, marry, and give birth, just like in normal towns, which is quite a rare case considering we're talking about Antarctica. It even has 43 buildings and a power line system powered by wind energy and is protected by military scout troops. It contributes annually to studies about ecology, biology, oceanography, glaciology, seismology, geology, biology, and even limnology, which is the study of inland waters. Unfortunately, the Esperanza base is in disagreement with the British colony residing in Antarctica. The fight was regarded as the 1952 Hope Bay incident, where a group of Argentine shore guards decided to fire machine overheads towards the British survey team. The issue was resolved but caused a lot of issues for the base. In other words, you could say that it was a total icebreaker. Did you know about the broad range of countries claiming land in Antarctica? Tell us in the comments below, and if you're enjoying this video, go ahead and give us a like, share, and don't forget to subscribe as well if you haven't already. Number 4. Base Presidente Eduardo Fray Montalva If we're talking about real military bases, we expect real weapons and a real army, but those are not the ones we find in Antarctica, which is protected by a treaty that forces any base to be declared as a mere research facility, though there are some exceptions, such as this base. The base Presidente Eduardo Fray Montalva may be one of the only bases in Antarctica that has been operated by the Army themselves since 1969. It's located on King George Island in the Antarctic territory of Great Britain, owned by Chile. This base in particular only serves as escorts, providing assistance to visitors, carrying out search and rescue missions, and to secure the airspace for Chile's territory. It is specifically guarded and operated by Chile's Air Force personnel. The base itself can carry about 150 people in the summer and 80 in the winter. It has all the accommodations a town will need from hospitals, banks, supermarkets, and even its very own school. Additionally, it has an airstrip for visitors from Chile. This base is special as it is personally protected by the military, functions as the most important base for Chile, and is also one of the safest locations in Antarctica. Number 3. Deception Station the Deception Station was built on Deception Island in the South Shetland Islands part of Antarctica and founded in 1948. It was known as a prominently effective military base, manned by Argentina mainly for research purposes. That was until 1967, when the nearby volcano in the island it was sitting on erupted, forcing the evacuation of the base and for all operations on the base to stop. Though they would eventually start functioning again, it was only abrupt, as the location of the base became too dangerous to operate due to the repetitive volcanic eruptions. The island is apparently sitting on an active volcano. There have been reports of casualties from this base and it's known to have already endured three volcanic eruptions. Truly befitting of such a name, the deception station now remains abandoned during the winter season, but used as a volcano monitoring station during the summer by both the military and volcanologists. This helps keep everyone in Deception Island safe, and though history wasn't very kind to this station, it has now turned out to be a rather fascinating historical site. Number 2. The Artigas Base Uruguay, surprisingly, is the owner of one of the largest bases in Antarctica 
And as subtle as the country is, this base comes with its own secretive merits. The Artigas base is one of the 68 established bases in Antarctica and was built by the Uruguayan government in 1984. It was named after their national hero, Jose Gervasio Artigas. The General Artigas base is located in the south part of Antarctica on King George's Island. The base specializes and focuses on scientific research involving glaciology, atmospheric sciences, ocean sciences, earth sciences, and life sciences. But don't let those deep research topics deceive you, because this base is packed with military personnel, armaments, and logistics from the Uruguayan government. It's complete with all the military stuff you'd expect from a military outfit, from ground forces to naval ships, and even military aircraft. Thankfully, as any other base in this list, the Artigas base is registered as a research facility involved in research for Antarctica. However, one could say that Artigas is quite small for a military base, but Uruguay has gone to great measures to keep it safe and secure. The base, which is spread across 13 buildings, can hold up to 60 personnel and only 8 during winter time. The base has contributed a lot in filling out information about Antarctica. Number 1. Schatzgraber Nazi Base Not every base in Antarctica has humble research and good intentions behind its design. The Schatzgraber base was a military base built by the Nazis somewhere in Alexandra Island in Antarctica during Hitler's reign in 1942, right after Hitler decided to seize all of Russia's vodka. During this time, heavy research involving military tactics and weaponry was being conducted on the Schatzgraber base, that is until 1944 when all the personnel were poisoned by polar bear meat. Now, don't confuse the Schatzgraber base with the other secret Nazi base that researched high-tech weaponry and got nuked three times by America because that one was definitely a hoax, and this one is definitely not. Sadly, and as boring as it sounds, they found no flying saucers or laser guns on the base. In fact, the base was just later discovered in 2017 during a Russian expedition in Antarctica where they found well-preserved equipment, documents, and bunkers that once belonged to the Nazis. The base was thought to be crucial during World War II as it served as a place to organize troop movement by analyzing the meteorological space. The base is now under the jurisdiction of Russia, and it's likely they'll be building their own military base on top of it. Number 8. Pegasus Wreck on October 8, 1970, the pilots flying the Pegasus, a C-0121 Lockheed Constellation plane, knew a storm was coming their way. But they had no choice but to try and navigate their way through it, as they were running out of fuel and needed to reach their destination. There were 80 people on board, and they were all heading to Antarctica for a research mission. Snow and ice whipped through the air, causing the pilots to lose all visibility. The wind caused the aircraft to be trashed around, beating the plane so hard, bits and pieces started to rip off. The plane was going down. The Pegasus crashed into the snow and skidded along the ice before coming to a halt. Luckily, everyone on board survived and they were able to carry on with their research. Today, anyone near the McMurdo Station can take a trip to the wreck site, as the Pegasus is still there, gently resting beneath a thick blanket of ice and snow. The crash inspired researchers to rename the ice runway and airfield after the wrecked plane. However, in December of 2014, Pegasus Field closed due to an excess of summer melt. Number 7. Shackleton's Lost Photos in 2013, conservationists restoring exploration huts in Antarctica discovered a box of 22 old photographs frozen in a block of ice. The photos depicted events from one of the most famous and ill-fated polar expeditions ever, the Ross Sea Party, led by explorer Ernest Shackleton. Despite being frozen for a hundred years, the team was able to restore the pictures, offering a glimpse into the past of the tragic event that took place. A century ago, Ernest Shackleton and his team embarked on the first mission ever to cross the frozen continent from 1915 to 1917. It was called the Ross Sea Party, but the mission proved to be far more challenging than the group expected it to be. Shackleton's ship, the Endurance, definitely did not endure. They sailed right into hard ice, causing the ship to slow down significantly. Over the course of nine months, the ship eventually became totally stuck. Shackleton ordered his crew to abandon the ship and walk along the ice. After just three days on the ice, the crew watched as the ship sank into the icy depths below, prompting them to head towards open water in hopes of being rescued. But rescue never came. The team was hit by a blizzard and they were quickly running out of food and supplies. They made the choice to eat 69 of the dogs they had with them. Many of the crew members died. 
Fast forward to April 1916, the remaining team managed to reach Elephant Island, where they took three lifeboats back to the shores of South Georgia. Shackleton, however, was not through with expeditions. In late 1921, he set off on another mission to the South Pole. His goal was to circumnavigate the Antarctic, but on January 5, 1922, Shackleton had a heart attack on his ship and died. The photos found by the conservationists showcase what things were like for those in the Ross Sea Party. The fascinating yet eerie photos document the scene and the faces of the team on their daring journey. Number 6. Bone Circle in 2020, the mysterious and chilling discovery of a series of Paleolithic structures dating back 20,000 years left scientists and archaeologists scratching their heads. These aren't normal structures. They're bone circles made from mammoths. The circular structures appear to be dwellings, and it's giving researchers clues as to how ancient communities survived Europe's last ice age. Researchers traveled to an area 311 miles from Moscow, in the freezing tundra of Ukraine and the West Russian plain to study this. Approximately 70 of these structures are known to exist in the region. One mighty example measures 30 by 30 feet and contains no less than 64 mammoth skulls as well as 51 jawbones. Bones from reindeer and foxes were found as well, but mostly this society relied on mammoths, so there must have been a bunch of them. The bones were likely sourced from animal graveyards. Over time, the bone circle was hidden by sediment and is now a foot below current surface level. Archaeologists from the University of Exeter were excited to also discover the remains of charred wood and other soft, non-woody plants within the circular structure. This shows that those that lived here were burning wood as well as bones for fuel. This is the first evidence of our ancestors doing this. Communities who lived there learned where to forage for edible plants during the Ice Age. The plants could have also been used for medicines, poisons, clothing, and more. Over 50 small charred seeds were found, the remains of plants growing locally or possibly food remains from meals. Once the winters grew longer and colder, most communities left the region, probably due to the lack of prey to hunt and plant resources they depended upon for survival. Eventually, the bone circles were abandoned as the climate continued to get more inhospitable. It was busy here by the sounds of it before they abandoned the area. The presence of a spring leads some to believe that this water source is what drew both man and beast here. Number 5. Warning in a Bottle while we think of the climate change debate as a relatively recent thing, it has actually been talked about for years. A strange example of this involved a bottle, which was found on Ward Hunt Island in the Canadian Arctic in 2013 by experts exploring the remote location. The bottle was uncovered from beneath some rocks. Inside the bottle was a message written by one Paul T. Walker, a geologist who lived in the 1950s. Written in the message were measurements relating to the distance between the rocks and a glacier. At the time, this was reportedly four feet. So far, so weird. But this wasn't just some random eccentric guy having fun out in the snow. You see, Walker was also asking for the measurements to be retaken by the person who found the message. Two experts obliged and saw that the distance had grown significantly over the decades. It had gone from 4 feet to over 300 feet. This is proof that temperatures had risen in that area and disrupted the environment. This is climate change in action. However, there's a particularly sad dimension to the story aside from the world-changing aspect. Walker requested that whoever found his message let him know the new measurements. Unfortunately, this was impossible to do because he died just months after leaving the site. Still, he laid the groundwork for people to look further into the issue, and his efforts showed that people cared about climate change way earlier than we may have thought. Have you ever found a message in a bottle? What did it say? Let us know in the comments below, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit subscribe. Number 4 Mysterious Ice Swirls In February of 2021, mysterious swirls found atop a frozen creek in Alabama have left meteorologists scratching their heads. Social media did what it does best and launched all kinds of strange conspiracy theories, mostly about extraterrestrials and the formations being comparable to alien-created crop circles. 
the hypnotic spiral spread across Anderson Creek, a 600-foot wide tributary of the Tennessee River in North Alabama. A man named Wynell Kirkham from Rogersville, 45 miles, shared photos of the circles on Facebook with only a one-word comment, wow. It really is quite the sight to see, though experts aren't sold on the whole alien invasion thing. Way 31 chief meteorologist Kate McKenna said that she believes that near the shoreline, the water is more shallow, causing it to freeze more easily and to cool down quickly. Then the wind blows that thin sheet of ice out into the water and out into the middle of the creek. Then the water near the shoreline again starts to refreeze and the wind blowing that ice out into the lake causes each layer and each ring to form, kind of like rings in a tree trunk. James Spann, a meteorologist of ABC 3340, gave a slightly different explanation, saying that the pattern occurs when moving water forces the forming ice to slowly rotate, and shear is involved. On one side of the creek, you have water that's moving faster than on the other side, causing the ice to make the swirling formations. Again, these are only theories, and other explanations may exist. The truth is out there. Hmm. Now, where have we heard that expression before? Number 3. Ice Shelf Creatures The Filkneron Ice Shelf floating on top of the sea in the Antarctic is the planet's second largest ice shelf, measuring over 166,000 square miles. The biggest is the Ross Ice Shelf. The epic scale of these things is truly massive, and there's actually still quite a lot we don't know about them. Before 2021, researchers didn't believe there could be any life living beneath the ice here, as the conditions are some of the harshest on the planet. That's why they were shocked to discover that after drilling some 4,045 feet down into the thick ice, there was not only life, but a whole heap of different life forms. And what's even more surprising is the fact that these mysterious life forms were found by chance. People weren't even looking for them. In fact, they started drilling into the ice initially to search for sediment that they wanted to use in order to study the mammoth ice shelf's development. To begin with, the sediment team had to penetrate mile upon mile of ice just to take samples. How do they do that? By heating a pipe and pushing it down. How do you heat it? With hot water. A lot of hot water. 4,400 gallons to be precise. Enough to cut through 20 tons of ice. Then they sent a camera down there for a look-see. The camera struck a rock which probably gave the team a bit of a shock. However, they realized that on the rock was a microbial mat. In other words, a layer of bacteria. So it seems life does find a way, even in an inhospitable and closed-off environment such as this. Typically, creatures of the deep would feed on something called marine snow. Certainly an appropriate term to use in that situation, but of course it's not actual snow, more the disintegrating remains of life forms that pass away and drift to the seafloor. How does that happen with an enormous ice sheet over the top of you? Scientists are still trying to figure that out. There's speculation over this discovery. It could be an exciting new chapter of marine study, or it's simply a random rock that found itself way out of its comfort zone. This discovery is literally the tip of the iceberg. Well, ice shelf. Number 2. Frozen Volcano we are aware volcanoes are extremely hot, and that's putting it lightly. But did you know a volcano can also produce ice, if the conditions are right? Located in the Sunda Strait between the Indonesian islands of Sumatra and Java is a volcano known as Anak Krakatau. It first started erupting on December 22, 2018. The eruption generated not only lava and hot ash, but also an estimated 10 million tons of ice. The bizarre discovery was made by an international research team that was studying satellite images of the eruption plume. A plume is a column of blazing volcanic ash and gas emitted into the atmosphere when a volcano starts doing what volcanoes do. A key element of the process that experts looked at was volcanic lightning. Yep, volcanoes also produce lightning. Who knew? This involves static electricity produced as all those volcanic ingredients come together in a colossal eruption. 
Tens of thousands of electrical discharges were studied by the team, which led them to believe that ice was part of the deal. As you know, water and electricity is not a good mix, so the ice particles were noticeable, owing to how they reacted against the static. Based on the number of electric charges, researchers estimate that during the eruption of Anak Krakatau, at least 10 million tons of ice formed. Number 1. Sasha the Woolly Rhino How do you bring a rhino that's thousands of years old back to life? through a combination of embalming and taxidermy, of course. That's what happened to Sasha, a baby rhino who perished at just seven months old. The body was discovered in Russia's Sakha Republic in 2014. It isn't known what sex Sasha is, hence the gender-neutral name. What experts do know is that Sasha is 35,000 to 50,000 years old and may have died from drowning. The image of a Paleolithic rhino is known about from ancient paintings, but this is the first time the real thing can be studied to see if the depictions are accurate. As it turns out, the rhino is bigger and prettier than first thought. Yes, we did say prettier. You see, Sasha has been blessed with strawberry blonde curls, certainly not what you'd expect to see from this type of animal. Sasha was first believed to be gray, at least that's how most mammoths look when dug out from the frost. Further information was obtained by studying the creature's bones. It suggests the rhino had a plant-based diet, though ultimately there's no way of really knowing. The ice has preserved the body to a surprising degree, with parts of the horn still visible. But scientists were out of luck when it came to stomach contents. We've seen all kinds of strange things that have been found frozen in ice on the list, but Sasha, the woolly baby rhino, is easily the most interesting. Sure, a plane or a sea sponge or bones are pretty cool, but this is the closest we've got to seeing something that actually lived back in the day. It's been arguably the world's most bizarre taxidermy project, but the work appears to be worthwhile. Number 10. Edward Bolin. There's a stretch of remote coastline in northern Namibia 500 miles long, and it's known for having some of the harshest and most unforgiving conditions on the planet. Death is ever present. It's littered with animal remains and dozens of decaying shipwrecks that lost the battle against the elements, which is why it's called the Skeleton Coast. Over the last several hundred years, more than 500 ships have wrecked in thick fog, rough seas, unpredictable currents, and heavy winds. Sailors who survived and managed to reach land often died of thirst in the scorching desert heat. One of the most famous shipwrecks along the Skeleton Coast is the Edward Bolin, a 310-foot-long cargo ship that became trapped in fog and ran aground in 1909. The desert encroached upon the shoreline over the following years, leaving the ship partially buried in the sand. Today, it sits over a thousand feet away from the water near two other wrecks, the Otavi and the MV Dunedin Star. The MV Dunedin Star was a cargo ship that ran aground in 1942, and the Otavi foundered and sank in 1945. Some of the ships along the Skeleton Coast are even older, dating as far back as the 16th century. The scattered wrecks are a haunting reminder of how disaster and death defined the entire region. Number 9. Dimitrios There's a rusting cargo ship sitting along the shoreline a few miles from the Greek town of Githio. It's known as the Dimitrios. The 220-foot-long vessel was built in Denmark in 1950. There are conflicting stories about how it ended up abandoned on the beach at Valtaki. According to one rumor, the ship was used for smuggling cigarettes between Turkey and Italy. Authorities seized it at Githio and supposedly released it from the port on purpose, treating it as if it wasn't their problem. Then someone set it on fire to hide evidence of its involvement in illicit trade. A more vague story describes the Demetrios as a ghost ship of unknown origin. A book written by the former honorary chief of the Hellenic Coast Guard, Vice Admiral Christos Ntunis, claims that the ship made an emergency docking in 1980 because the captain had a serious illness that he needed treatment for. Several things went wrong after that. The ship started having engine problems and the crew ran into financial and insurance issues. Then they were all fired. Over the next several months, the Demetrios continued to deteriorate. Water got into the hull, causing it to list. The ship was declared dangerous and port authorities asked the owners to move it. They didn't respond for several months and bad weather stranded the vessel at its current site. There were no attempts to salvage it. Number 8. Bessie White 
Violent storms are known to make ships disappear, but sometimes they make long-forgotten vessels reappear after getting lost beneath the sand and waves. A Canadian coal schooner called the Bessie White is one such example. The ship encountered heavy fog and ran aground near Fire Island in New York State in either 1919 or 1922, according to conflicting historical records. It quickly began to take on water and the crew escaped on lifeboats. Thankfully, they all survived and only one person was injured. But the Bessie White and the coal it was carrying were a total loss. Anything salvageable was removed from the wreck over the following weeks. The rest of the ship was eventually swept out to sea. When Hurricane Sandy battered the region in 2012, a large part of what's believed to be the ship's wooden hull was exposed. It had become buried along the shore and forgotten about until the storm caused it to resurface. Since then, the hull has been covered and uncovered and is often at least partially visible. Nobody knows for sure if the artifact is from the Bessie White, but all the signs point toward it. Either way, it's clearly a part of a very old ship that was left behind long ago. Number 7. Hilma Hooker The crew of the Dutch-built freighter Hilma Hooker had no idea they were being watched by law enforcement when the 236-foot-long vessel began experiencing engine problems in the Caribbean back in 1984. They had it towed to Kralenjik, a port city on the island of Bonaire. Authorities searched the boat after the captain failed to hand over the proper registration documents. They found 25,000 pounds of marijuana hidden in a false bulkhead. The suspects were detained, but they refused to identify the Hilma Hooker's owner, and detectives never figured out who the owner was. It's probably safe to say that the person knew better than to come forward, or they'd face serious problems with the law. Meanwhile, the ship deteriorated as it sat neglected as evidence. It eventually began taking on water. Authorities got sick of pumping water out of it and began to worry that it would sink and disrupt maritime traffic. They relocated the Hilma Hooker, and it seems as though they had perfect timing. Just days later, it began to list. It then rolled onto its side and sank to the sea floor. Today, it sits between two coral reef systems 95 feet beneath the waves. Most of the interior is off limits to divers, but the wreck is nevertheless one of the most popular Caribbean diving sites due to the water's crystal clear visibility. Number 6. Kodiak Queen The Kodiak Queen first took to the seas as a U.S. Navy fuel barge in 1940. It's thought to be one of just five ships that survived the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor the following year. After World War II, it was repurposed as a fishing vessel. It remained in use for several decades until eventually finding its way to a junkyard. Historian Mike Cochran rediscovered the rusting abandoned ship in 2012 and launched a campaign to save it from being scrapped or left to rot. It drew widespread attention, catching the interest of British photographer Owen Buggy. He suggested sinking the Kodiak Queen into an underwater art exhibit and artificial reef. A sculpture of the legendary Kraken sea monster was built around the ship as if it were dragging it into the sea floor. It was submerged off Virgin Gorda in 57-foot deep waters in 2017. Later that year, the region was hit with catastrophic hurricanes. Both the sculpture and the Kodiak Queen survived, but they were damaged by huge swells, which moved the exhibit about 30 feet from its original place. Thankfully, it remained in good enough condition to function as a marine habitat and has become a popular diving site. Would you ever take the dive to see this wreck in person? Let us know in the comments below and if you're liking this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel for more content like this. Number 5. SS Richard Montgomery Built in Jacksonville, Florida during World War II, the SS Richard Montgomery was an American Liberty-class cargo ship. It was named after an Irish officer who fought in the American Revolution. The ship had been in service for just a little over a year when she departed Philadelphia for Great Britain in what would turn out to be her final voyage. While waiting at the Thames estuary to join a convoy bound for France, the Richard Montgomery ran aground on a sandbank in 24 feet of water. Days later, workers began removing the cargo from inside the ship. For the next several weeks, it was a race against the clock, trying to save what they could before abandoning the salvage effort. Shortly thereafter, the vessel broke in two. She remains at the site to this day, where her three masts are visible at all times. In 1973, the British Maritime and Coast Guard Agency classified the wreck as dangerous due to the unexploded ordnance that was left aboard, including 1,500 tons of TNT. There's an exclusion zone around the ship that the authorities monitor both visually and with radar. In 2004, New Scientist magazine investigated government documents and other evidence relating to the wreck and determined that the Richard Montgomery's cargo is still quite deadly. Declassified documents revealed that the wreck was not handled properly in the immediate aftermath of the sinking or any time after that. 
Late last year, officials announced plans to dismantle the ship, which they say has the potential to cause mass damage and potential loss of life if the explosive cargo isn't removed. Number 4. SS Palo Alto The SS Palo Alto was built toward the end of World War I with a combination of concrete and steel called ferro-concrete, which was cheaper than building the entire ship out of steel. It was designed as a tanker for the U.S. Navy, but by the time the vessel was completed in 1919, the conflict was over. The Palo Alto was mothballed for the next 10 years. In 1929, the Sea Cliff Amusement Corporation bought it and grounded it off the coast of Northern California with plans to turn it into an entertainment complex. It featured a dance floor, a cafe, a swimming pool, and more. Later that year, the stock market crashed. The economy was devastated, causing unforeseen financial problems for the ship's owners. Just a few years later, the Sea Cliff Amusement Corporation went bankrupt. Then the ship cracked in rough seas during a winter storm. The state of California bought the ship and turned it into a fishing pier but poor weather continued to batter the Palo Alto, rendering it unsafe. The pier closed in 1950. A restoration attempt was made during the 80s, and the site was reopened for a few years. It was reopened yet again in 2016, but was soon closed down for repairs and has remained off-limits to the public ever since. In the early 2000s, dozens of seabirds were killed by oil that was eventually traced to the ship. Its fuel tank was cracked and leaking, and the pollution wreaked havoc on the environment. Workers found hundreds of dead birds and harbor seals during a $1.7 million cleanup of the site. The Palo Alto continued to fall apart in the following years. In 2017, record-breaking 34-foot storm waves broke the ship in half. It now sits in four pieces, and any hope of restoring it has been lost. Number 3. MV Dayspring The small town of Korpok is located at a natural harbor in the Scottish Highlands. It's home to a wrecked fishing boat called the MV Dayspring, which has sat along the shoreline since it ran aground due to bad weather in 2011. The vessel was built in 1975 and was used for catching mackerel and herring for years until 2000. It had been moored for over a decade when a vicious storm ripped it from its mooring and moved it to its current site. Locals call it the Old Boat of Cowl or the Korpok Shipwreck. It sits against the scenic backdrop of the surrounding mountains and is entirely visible serving as a constant reminder of just how powerful Mother Nature is. The boat is accessible from all sides during low tide. In 2017, the Dayspring's buoy triggered its distress beacon. A large rescue effort ensued, only for emergency workers to eventually realize that the signal was coming from a long-abandoned wreck. It's unclear whether there are plans to ever move or scrap the vessel. Number 2. Peter Eardale Peter Eardale was a businessman from London who lived during the 19th century. In 1890, he had a four-masted sailing vessel built in England and named it after himself. It eventually made its way over to North America. The Peter Eardale was nearing the end of a journey from Mexico to Portland, Oregon in 1906 when it encountered thick fog, strong gusts, and a rising tide at the mouth of the Columbia River, which is notoriously difficult to navigate. Its captain, H. Lawrence, tried to steer the boat away from the shore, but it was no match for the rough seas and powerful winds. It ran aground with 27 passengers aboard, including two stowaways who had snuck onto the vessel. A lifeboat came to the scene and rescued everyone, who managed to escape without any injuries. H. Lawrence and the rest of the crew were absolved of any blame for the incident following an investigation, and they were commended for the way they handled the situation. There was very little damage to the hull, and plans were made to retrieve it, but bad weather kept delaying the salvage effort. In the meantime, the boat's condition worsened. Soon enough, the Peter Eardale began to list and got stuck in the sand as it languished at the crash site. In 1917, someone bought the salvaging rights, but they never did anything with the stranded vessel. It's still there to this day. Time and the elements have turned it into a shell of its former self, leaving just the bow and a few ribs and masts that will eventually probably get washed away completely. Number 1. SS Thistlegarm the British merchant navy ship SS Thistlegurm only completed three successful voyages before she went down in the Red Sea during World War II. She was sunk by German bombers the year after she was built. The Thistlegurm spent her short-lived career transporting steel rails, aircraft parts, grain, and rum between the U.S., Argentina, and the West Indies. She embarked on her final voyage in 1941, leaving Glasgow, Scotland for Alexandria, Egypt, with cargo consisting of motorcycles, armored vehicles, trucks, guns, ammo, radio equipment, aircraft and railway parts, and two train locomotives. When the 420-foot-long ship reached the Suez Canal, there was an accident blocking the waterway. The captain had no choice but to dock the vessel off the Egyptian coast. 
Suspecting that the Allies were trying to enter Egypt, the Nazis dispatched a pair of bombers with orders to find and destroy the ship. Two bombs struck the Thistlegorm, causing some of the ammunition on board to explode. Nine people died in the attack. French explorer Jacques Cousteau discovered the wreck during the 1950s, but it was soon forgotten about. The coastal city of Sharm el-Sheikh opened the wreck to divers in the early 1990s. Visitors can access the ship's interior via an opening that was created during the disaster. Most of the cargo remains inside to this day. Many consider the Thistlegorm to be the world's best wreck dive. It sits roughly 100 feet beneath the surface, where some advanced diving skills are required, but the water is shallow enough not to need any special equipment. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about abandoned ships, let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next time for more amazing videos right here on American Eye.